welcome to all attendees. Uh, thank you so much for uh, signing up, up for this. Um, so I'm uh, Peter S. Williams, not to be confused with uh, another frequent uh, attendee at uh, ELF, uh, Peter J. Williams. Both of us are from England. Uh, he's the, the guy from Tyndale House and uh, I'm the uh, philosopher apologist from down south in Southampton. I'm also an assistant professor at uh, Gimlekollen College in uh, Norway. Uh, you can see here on the screen, hopefully, my Twitter handle and my email and my website address. And uh, at my website, you'll find out lots more. Let us get started with uh, having a look at uh, evidence for Old Testament history. Uh, and I'm going from uh, Abraham's uh, Ur to Daniel in Babylon. First section, let us start with uh, looking at uh, what uh, the British atheist Richard Dawkins, uh, one of the uh, most famous members of the so-called New Atheist Movement, uh, has to say about Old Testament history, uh, especially in his uh, recent book, Outgrowing God, A Beginner's Guide, uh, a book aimed at an adult uh, audience. So he makes uh, a number of assertions, I do mean just assertions, about Old Testament history in Outgrowing God, including these. He says, uh, biblical scholars don't take the Old Testament seriously as history. He asserts that uh, this or that Old Testament story makes what he calls an extraordinary claim requiring extraordinary evidence. He asserts that there's an absence of extra biblical outside of the bible evidence for the historical truth of certain old testament stories that he talks about and finally he asserts this the existence of extra biblical evidence that actually counts against the historical truth of certain old testament stories well that's a whole lot of asserting to do first of all for a book uh, that's supposed to be encouraging young people to ask for evidence for what they believe. This is the sort of major point of his opening chapter, is to sort of say that, you know, truth matters and competing religious claims can't all be true and you shouldn't just believe things because you were brought up to believe it and uh, you ought to go and ask, what's the evidence? Uh, and then unfortunately in uh, the rest of the book, uh, Richard Dawkins does a lot of asserting things without giving anybody any evidence, uh, even to the extent that there are no footnotes and no bibliography uh, in the book for people to pursue. So let's go through uh, these assertions briefly, uh, starting with uh, biblical scholars don't take the Old Testament seriously as history. Well, of course, some don't, um, but some certainly do. Um, Dawkins' assertion is simply a false generalization. Uh, we have the assertion that this or that Old Testament story makes an extraordinary claim requiring extraordinary evidence, a sort of um, slogan that goes back uh, to uh, famously Carl Sagan uh, used it uh, in the 70s um, in his uh, TV series Cosmos. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Um, well, what do you mean by extraordinary uh, in both of those clauses is, uh, doesn't really uh, help us uh, very much. It, and indeed, this goes back to the Enlightenment Scottish philosopher David Hume and his uh, notorious arguments against the believability of miracles. Uh, this is a sort of uh, third hand reheated fallacious Humeanism. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, the assertion that an absence of extra biblical evidence uh, uh, for the historical truth of certain Old Testament stories, uh, well, uh, again, this is uh, sort of cribbing this uh, argument about uh, humanism here. Now, yeah, that's my PowerPoint slightly wrong there. Um, this is a, a nice slide from Tim uh, McGrew, who. Um, so this really boils down to uh, often an argument that goes something like this. 
extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, uh, and the claim that a miracle occurred is extraordinary. Therefore, any evidence supporting it ought to be extraordinary as well. Um, I'm not sure what I mean by extraordinary, but whatever you come up with, it's not going to work. Therefore, uh, I don't have to believe in your miracle claim, basically. This is just pointing out, that it, it, without actually defining what extraordinary is, it's just being used as a slogan. And as soon as you actually carefully define what uh, extraordinary claims or extraordinary evidence would have to be, um, either you're get, setting out a series of claims which could potentially be met and you have to have, actually look at the evidence and see whether or not it meets uh, the criteria, or you're just in advance of looking at the evidence, uh, sort of deliberately setting the bar uh, to be leapt over so, so high that no potential uh, amount of uh, empirical evidence could ever convince you that a miracle has, has happened. You're taking a sort of a priori approach, um, which although it sounds like you're saying, you know, show me the evidence, it's all about we need evidence. Uh, actually, you're 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 kicking evidence out of the out of the consideration, uh, out of the playing field. Anyway, as William Lane Craig, uh, American Christian philosopher, notes that the fallaciousness of Hume's reasoning, which this is a sort of bastardized version of, has been recognised by the majority of philosophers writing on the subject today, and that's not just the majority of Christian philosophers; that's the majority of philosophers. Um, so, for example, I got a cover up here of John Ehrman, who's an agnostic philosopher. He wrote a book called Hume's Abject Failure, The Argument Against Miracles. Um, and if you want to pursue this uh, more, you could either uh, get uh, Ehrman's book or uh, there's a chapter in my recent book, Getting at Jesus, uh, which looks at what the neo-atheist movement says about Jesus. There's a chapter in there dealing at length with the issue of uh, miracles and uh, the new atheists uh, use of Hume uh, to defend their failure to really engage seriously with evidence for miracles. So uh, this absence of extra biblical evidence, uh, this is where we should come on to this, uh, this is an argument from silence uh, and philosophers are very wary of arguments from silence uh, as arguments trying to show that anything is the case. Um, we have a very limited access to the past through the known chain of its effects. A couple of examples, we've got only 35 out of 142 books of Roman history that were written uh, by a chap called Livy, uh, and they survive in a couple of manuscripts, um, 20 manuscripts. Uh, the oldest of those from the 4th century, even though he's writing in uh, the BCAD sort of divide. Uh, again, we've got four and a half books out of 14 books of Roman history written by Tacitus, and those surviving two manuscripts from the 9th and 11th centuries. And yet, this is the kind of material that classical historians are well used to using and treating critically in order to do and write, you know, books on Roman history, right? So arguments from silence tend to make a, a, a they make an undisciplined shift from this uh, absence of evidence for or against uh, a claim to a conclusion about the truth or falsity of that claim. Uh, uh, that shift uh, is suspicious. Um, as atheist Victor Stenger himself and uh, one of the new atheist writers warned. An absence of evidence should only be treated as uh, evidence of absence, that is evidence of the falsity of a claim, when the evidence should be there and it's not, as he says. If the evidence should be there and we don't find it, then that means something. Uh, but otherwise, uh, arguments from an absence of evidence don't really show anything. Um, I like quoting from atheists when I can agree with them. And I think this is what's going on uh, in Dawkins' criticism of the Old Testament. For a comparison, think for a moment about something like the Book of Mormon. Uh, when we compare the Book of Mormon to archaeology in uh, the States, uh, 
we find a pervasive lack of expected evidence. So Dr. David Johnson, who's a professor of anthropology at Brigham Young University, uh, states that there is no archaeological proof of the Book of Mormon. There's absolutely no archaeological evidence that you can tie directly to events that are meant to have taken place in the Book of Mormon. For example, in Mormon 6, uh, there's a claim that hundreds of thousands of people were killed on or near the Hill Cumorah during uh, a battle. And we would expect to find some artifacts from such a large battle such a long time ago. Um, for a comparison, um, thousands of bullets have been found at the site of far smaller uh, American Civil War battle uh, of Gettysburg. Um, but this battle, although uh, longer, meant to be longer ago, is of course meant to be much larger. Uh, but nothing has been found at Hill Cumorah that ties to this uh, supposed slaughter. Uh, and I think this is the sort of absence of evidence that constitutes evidence of absence and makes one wonder. Uh, not the kind that we get uh, with uh, the Old Testament. Finally, Dawkins asserts that there is the existence of extra biblical evidence against the historical truth of certain Old Testament stories. Um, this, unfortunately, is simply a matter of ignorance on his part uh, repeatedly. Now, history, uh, the study or the record of past events, uh, especially events of a, a particular period or country or subject, uh, philosopher Daniel Little uh, notes that ultimately the historian's task is to shed light on the, the what, the why, and the how of the past, based on inferences from the evidence of the present. So as I say, we access the past through its remaining evidential traces that have been discovered in the present. And of course, there may be remaining evidential traces of the past that haven't yet been discovered or that very unlikely ever to be discovered because people are you know, living on top of them and don't want their houses dug up and so on. Archaeology, as a sort of sub-branch of, of history, or a scientific discipline that contributes to history, if you like, is the systematic study of the material remains of past human behavior. So digging up the things that people made. Professor John Monson notes that archeological evidence is scattered, uh, random and incomplete, just like those books of Tacitus and so on that we were talking about. Uh, he says, just as the Bible's record is uh, selective, ancient and theologically orientated. So the, the Bible's written for particular purposes, with its own uh, particular uh, angle on the events of the day and so on. And we have a very um, incomplete and kind of random sampling of what we've discovered of what happens to have survived from the past. And then we're trying to relate those things together in archeology span and, and, and history. Uh, any attempt to relate these two sets of information is fraught with, with challenges. This is uh, a difficult field. And of course, archaeologists bring different worldviews to their interpretation of data. It's not as simple as just digging up something. You have to interpret it, uh, what it means, how it relates to the biblical text. Um, so what is the biblical text actually claiming? Uh, and so on. All these sort of hermeneutical interpretative questions come into play on, on both sides here. It's good to know about um, the distinction in the field between so-called minimalism and maximalism in archaeology. As uh, Michael Heiser here notes, for those unfamiliar with this minimalist-maximalist debate over biblical archaeology, uh, the former, uh, the minimalists, basically believe the Old Testament has little or no historical value. This is where Richard Dawkins plants uh, his flag, if you like. Uh, they think it was entirely written 
uh, during or after the Babylonian exile period. That's when they think the Old Testament was written. Uh, so they're very skeptical uh, about um, stories about the patriarchal events or the Exodus, for example. Maximists, on the other hand, uh, disagree on what I'd call a continuum of optimism about the biblical text as a historical source. And again, this is not just applying to sort of Christians versus non-Christians uh, or uh, Jews uh, versus uh, non-Jews, uh, atheist scholars. There are, of course, atheists and agnostics and, and Jews and Christians and people of other worldviews and religions who are historians and archaeologists who are involved in this debate. So uh, Dr. Israel Finkelstein is a Jewish archaeologist and he's a minimalist. Uh, he says the world in which the Bible was created uh, was not a mythic realm of great cities and saintly heroes, but a tiny down-to-earth kingdom. The historical saga contained in the Bible, from Abraham's encounter with God and his journey uh, to Canaan, uh, to Moses' deliverance of the children of Israel, to the rise and fall of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, was not a miraculous revelation, but a brilliant product of the human imagination just a product of imagination. They're fairy tales, basically, you say. Whereas, on the other hand, sure there are historians who take the Bible seriously. Uh, Dr. Walter Kaiser Jr. from his A History of Israel uh, says that the evidence for the truthfulness and historicity of the Bible continues to mount up as never before. Just when skepticism seems to be making the most noise, we're being flooded with an overwhelming amount of real hard evidence that demands a verdict opposite to what minimalists are clamoring for. Never has any previous generation seen the amount and significance of evidence that are now available to us today. And we'll be seeing some, a sample of this evidence uh, together today. Likewise, uh, Christian philosopher Paul Copan here uh, notes that the once doubted historical claims of the Old Testament, uh, whether that's about the cost of slaves in the ancient Near East, or camels appearing on livestock lists during the time of Abraham, the kingship of David, the mines of Solomon, the metallurgy of the Philistines, the existence of the Hittites, uh, these claims turn out to be anchored in ancient Near East history. Uh, and we know that from extra biblical evidence. Uh, and just a slide that I, I couldn't exactly decide where to, to slip this in, but it's a point that I think bears mentioning. Something that had always struck me about the, the Bible and the Old Testament um, as I uh, read it even as a child uh, was that the, the Old Testament repeatedly passes what a historian would call the, the criterion of embarrassment. Uh, that is, it's brutally honest about the failings of its lead protagonists. Uh, and uh, people don't tend to tell stories that put themselves or their own people in a, in a bad light. Um, if this book is just being written up in the Babylonian exile in order to uh, give the Jewish people a sense of community and uh, community bonding and to make themselves feel good and so on, then why would you uh, make up such an embarrassing history in such a set in a sense where you know moses uh, committed murder or at least manslaughter uh, and tried to avoid god's calling to confront uh pharaoh uh, king david committed adultery with bathsheba and arranged for her husband to be in the front line of a battle so he'd get killed and the nation of Israel repeatedly fails to live up to the covenant uh, with God and so on. So as we go through in the following sections, uh, the kind of overarching argument that I'll be making is summarised nicely by the Christian philosopher Lydia McGrew here, gives this nice sort of uh, analogy. She says, if you sample a loaf of bread on both ends and at several points in the middle and find it find it good it would be uh, curvailing it would be being far too skeptical if you then said that well perhaps the parts that you haven't tasted yet happen to be the moldy ones 
right? If we keep sampling claims that the Old Testament histories make, and we can show that they're historically plausible, uh, the more that we do that, the more it would be being too sceptical to say, well, perhaps it's just the bits that we haven't been able to check that are unreliable. Uh, so repeated confirmations of particular facts tend to confirm not only those particular facts, but the sources that report those facts.